Hey, have you heard any good books lately? This is Talking Audiobooks, your weekly podcast for all news, discussion, and opinions surrounding the wonderful world of audiobooks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Wherever you are, whenever you may be listening, this is the Talking Audiobooks podcast, season number two, episode number five. I am your host, the man with the face made for radio and the voice made for print, Casey Trowbridge, and I am very happy to be with you. Talking Audiobooks presents Industry News. We have a few things to get into on this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks, a couple of interesting news items. I want to first remind you again to head over to audiobooks.com slash audiobook month and see all the different things that they're giving away this june is audiobook month which is fast coming to a a finish but there's still a few things that you can do over there take advantage of enter some contests get some free books and things of that nature check out audiobooksync sync.com you can get two more free summer titles this week for um, the fact that uh, they want to keep teens and young listeners active and engaged in listening through the summer months we are past the halfway point so there are still plenty of books for you to acquire this summer there's two each week so check out this week's offerings Um, just one bit of news this week that i came up with which i thought was interesting and it'll be just a brief news item this week but it'll be something that we explore more in depth going forward not necessarily this particular uh, bit of news but uh, what this means and if this is a trend and um, how you feel about such a trend and that is there's a new book coming out at the end of july july 25th it's called star wars battlefront 2 infernal squad it's a sequel to rogue one which was in theaters last december and it is a prequel to the Battlefront 2 video game. And what's interesting about this is that the narrator is a woman who, to my knowledge, has never narrated an audiobook before. In fact, when I looked at her on audible.com, the only audiobook that I saw next to her name or in her search results was this Star Wars book. So it's possible that this is the first in fact it's likely because um i can't think of too many audiobooks that aren't on audible.com but it's not likely that she has a large category and her name is janina gavankar that's g-a-v-a-n-k-a-r janina is j-i-n-i-n-a what is interesting about this and the thing that we will be talking about in the future is the fact that she is the voice actor behind the character of Aiden Versio in the Battlefront 2 video game and as the lead in that game she was chosen to narrate the audiobook which sort of tells how the Inferno squad from the video game came to be after the events of Rogue One and it's always interesting to me because when books that are tied to certain characters certain famous characters come out there's always a thing where people say it would be so nice if they could get so-and-so to narrate the book if so-and-so is the person who provided the voice for that character in a tv show a movie or you know what have you lots of people say oh it would be nice to do that and sometimes those expectations are a little bit much there's a book those guys have all the fun which is an oral history of espn and looking at audible reviews of it something that comes up a lot is a reviewer will say oh it would be so nice if they could get each of the interview subjects to come in and narrate their own quotes so like you'd have Chris Berman come in and narrate his quotes and Bill Simmons narrate his and Dan Patrick narrate his and all these different ESPN personalities narrate their own quotes from the book. And that would be really cool 
it would also mean the book could never come out because that would just be too hard of an undertaking uh, to, to do and it would be a little weird it's not really practical at this point there would have been massive delays in getting a book project like that done and it would have been really expensive to get everybody uh, together and, or not together but to get all the all the different files together and to you know book recording time for people to come into the studio so those are a little bit loftier expectations but having a person narrate for a character that they uh, perform regularly is a little bit different and um, James Arnold Taylor the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi in uh, the Clone Wars cartoon series another Star Wars thing he uh, has narrated segments of the Star Wars Kenobi audiobook that came out a few years ago and he did a great job on those individual segments but as he pointed out in interviews and as just logic would tell you it's a little bit different to narrate the audiobook than to perform a voice on a tv series because in an audiobook you have to do everything you have to be the narrator you have to be all the characters you can't just be the character that you voice on a regular basis so it's a little bit more daunting in that respect i would think and it doesn't necessarily mean that the person who provides the voice for a specific character would necessarily be the best person to um, narrate an entire book. Uh, it did happen recently in Star Wars. And again, I'm using these Star Wars examples because I'm familiar with them. And if you can think of other examples of this phenomena, I would like to hear about it. And you could tell me how you thought it went. But Ashley Eckstein, who is the voice of Ahsoka Tano on the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels, she read the Star Wars Ahsoka book that came out in October of last year. And I thought she did a pretty good job doing all of the characters, including, of course, Ahsoka Tano herself. And I thought that experience turned out well, but there's no guarantee and you never know. And so it'll be interesting to listen to Janina Gavankar uh, read this audiobook of this character that uh, is being introduced in a video game. And that's a little bit more interesting as well because it's not like it's an established character that people know a lot about. So they're going to have prejudgments in their minds of what the character should be and what it should sound like. So that will help her as well in finding the voice for that character and any others that might be introduced in the book. When you have all new characters, there's a little bit more room you have to play with. Um, when you're doing Obi-Wan Kenobi, in contrast, you have established performances by Alec Guinness and Ewan McGregor and James Arnold Taylor that uh, you can compare them to. So that makes it a little bit more difficult. So I am very interested to listen to that book, not just because it's a Star Wars book, but because of the unique narration that will be taking place. They've never, to my knowledge, had anyone from a video game narrate an audio book before in the Star Wars franchise. So that could be kind of fun. When there's an excerpt available, we'll probably put it into a future show. And again, this is something that if you have comments on, on the tactic in general you might not care about star wars but you might not uh you might know rather of something else where this has been done and you might have an opinion on it so um it'll be interesting to listen to that if you have any news items anything that you've read it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you want to promote yourself like if you come across an article and you say, hey, this is an interesting article. Uh, I think it would make for a good topic or a good comment section on your show. Send it to us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. So if you come across anything, just let us know. 
Hey, Talking Audiobook listeners, if you're listening to this podcast before the end of June 2017, you still have time to join our contest. And it's easy to join. You don't have to count jelly beans in a jar. You don't have to climb to the top of a mountain. All you have to do is send us email at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com and enter your chance to win six audiobooks from audible.com. That's six audiobooks of your choice from audible.com. Just send an email to feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com and you're automatically entered into the contest. And when you write, let us know what you think about the show. Give us your ideas, your suggestions, your thoughts. But the most important thing is send us an email to get yourself entered into the contest. Hurry, June is almost over. Still plenty of chances for you to get into the contest by emailing us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. But what we are going to do is we're going to give one person all six credits. And these are promo codes that you can redeem for any book that you would like from the Audible website. There's no strings attached. You're not going to get signed up to any newsletters, uh, nothing like that. That's all you have to do is enter feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com into your phone or into your email client or your desktop browser or whatever you send email from, feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. We would appreciate it if you'd comment on the show, tell us how we're doing, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. If you don't like me, that's okay. If you don't like Ken, you'll get a bonus entry or two, and um, your odds of winning will be better if you don't like Ken. No, I'm just kidding. The odds are the same regardless of whether you have uh, positive criticism, negative criticism, or what have you. Uh, If you have an answer to some of our feedback questions, we'd love to hear from you on those as well from either you know, this week or past weeks or next week, even. The deadline, as I've said, is the end of June. You could win six books. That, that's nothing to sneeze at, especially if you have a long wish list. That's plenty of credits to do some damage. You enter them, and you don't even have to use them right away. If you don't want to, you can just enter the promo codes, and we'll send you instructions for how to do that if you win. You can store them up and use them on a two-for-one sale, and you can get 12 books if you find 12 that you're interested in for the six promo credits that we will be sending you. Email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com with your question, your comment, uh, constructive feedback. Don't just say hi. I mean, you'll get entered, but we would really like to hear from you. We'd really like to hear more than just hi. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back and talk about our fan feedback question for this week. Uh, Our first break this week is going to be the PDQ release of the week from Ken. And he's going to tell you about this week's PDQ title. And then I'm going to be back and I'm going to talk to you about my audiobook White Whale or my audiobook Mount Everest, whichever uh, analogy suits you the best. So with that having all been said, here's Ken with this week's PDQ Release of the Week. When it comes to audiobooks, variety is the spice of life. Need something quick to listen to on your commute to and from work, or while running short errands, or just while running in your shorts? Take a commuter combo with you. Each commuter combo collection is four one-half-hour episodes pulled from a variety of categories like mysteries, crime dramas, comedies, science fiction, detectives, and more. This week's featured title contains Sherlock Holmes, The Accidental Murder, Philip Marlowe, Red Wind, the Inner Sanctum Mysteries, Beneficiary to Death, and X-1, and The Moon Be Just as Bright. Each half-hour episode is full and unabridged, and digitally remastered from the live recordings of original cast performances. 
take a listen to this excerpt from X Minus One's And the Moon Be Still as Bright. Written by science fiction master Ray Brother. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the Ray Bradbury story entitled, And the Moon Be Still as Bright. The first three expeditions for Mars left Earth in a mushroom of flame, arced through the atmosphere, and finally dwindled to tiny specks in the big eye of the Mount Palomar telescope, and then were lost to sight forever. The prearranged landing signals flashed back to Earth, and then the radios went dead. One after the other, ships had disappeared and were never heard from again. But still, the rockets came. The fourth expedition emerged from the silent gulfs of space, angled down toward the floating red disk of Mars, down into an orbit as the order came to land. The last blast of the bow jets broke red against the blue desert sands, and the ship slid to a halt at the edge of a vast city that reflected the icy glare of the moonlight. For a while, all was still. All right, park you. Open the airlock. Hi, sir. Ah, fresh air. Hey, it's cold out here. Who cares? We got here. I thought I'd never hit solid ground again. Hey, how about a fire, Captain Wildey? It's freezing. Later. We have work to do. Oh, smell that air. Why, oh, you could get drunk on it. Say, there's an idea. Why don't we break out a bottle and celebrate? Biggs, there will be no drinking done till we're secured. But we're landed, Captain. Three other expeditions landed and disappeared within 24 hours. Now, we're not relaxing security till we find out what happened to them. What do you mean? Maybe Martian? Sender, you're an archaeologist. How old would you say they are? I can't tell till I study them more closely. It's the kind of engineering we couldn't duplicate on Earth. Well, I'm not interested in the architecture now. I want to make sure there's nothing there that might be dangerous. Mr. Hathaway. Yes, sir? I want you and Spender to take a reconnaissance party into the city and find out what's there. We'll set up camp here. No man is to go more than 50 feet from this rocket. And there'll be no celebration till Hathaway and his party report back. In the sea bottoms, the wind stirred along faint vapors, and from the mountains, great stone visages looked upon the silvery rocket and the small fire. The sky was black overhead as the two racing moons threw knife-edged double shadows on the desert. All right, come and get it. Ciao. Hey, what do you got there, Jackie? Sort of smothered in cold chicken fat. Good. I thought it was something I couldn't eat. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Captain! Mr. Hathaway's back. Oh, Captain, Captain Wilder. Oh, yes, over here, Mr. Hathaway. Well? Most of the city's dead. Spender says it's been dead a good many thousand years, but we found one part about a mile over toward the... What about it? People were living in it last week, sir. People? Martians. Where are they now? Dead. We found bodies, thousands of bodies. They hadn't been dead more than ten days. What did they die of? You won't believe it. What killed them? Chicken pox. Chicken pox? Yes. Where could they get chicken pox? From Earth. Oh, then the other rockets did get through. Yes. I don't know what the Martians did to them, but I sure know what they did to the Martians. They gave them chicken pox and wiped them out. 
They just didn't have any resistance to an Earth disease. Now think of it, Captain. A race builds itself for a million years, refines itself, does everything it can to give itself respect and beauty, and then it dies. Of what? It's like saying the Greeks died of mumps or the proud Roman Empire collapsed because of athlete's foot. We didn't even give them a decent excuse for dying. We just gave them chicken pox. Spender, get hold of yourself. You didn't see those bodies, Captain. Yes, I know. It must have been a shock. You need a rest, a little relaxation. The Martians are dead. There's nothing you can do about that now. Hey, you hear that? The Martians are all dead. Come on, let's break out a bottle and hoop it out. How about a case, eh? Oh, good Lord. They have to do that now? Isn't there time later to throw old beer cans into the canals? Bender, you're an idealist. They're not. All they know now is that they're safe. A little shouting won't hurt. You think too much. I was safe on Mars. The first Earth men on Mars. We're going to celebrate. <laughs> yeah! You won't believe what happened next. Go to audible.com and search for Commuter Combo or follow the link in the show notes. Try out the Commuter Combo and see if it doesn't tickle your fancy for a lot of other great titles from PDQ Audiobooks. Here's Casey. And we're back, and thank you, Ken, for telling us all about that title from PDQ. And I want to encourage everybody to check out some of the PDQ catalog on audible.com because that will help the show immensely if you do that. Right now, I want to talk to you about an audiobook that I've never been able to finish. I've had it for over 10 years now. I've made several starts. I've gotten pretty far, but something has always come up and always kept me from getting to the finish line of this book. And it's not just a case where the book is boring and I hate it and I don't want to finish it because that is not true. I'm very interested in the subject matter. I think the book has a lot of very interesting information. It's just that I can only get so far and then something happens and I have to stop and I don't want to start over right away. And so by the time I'm ready to listen to it again, I feel like I should start from the beginning. I call this book my white whale or my Mount Everest because I keep trying to get to the end and the end has eluded me for so long. It's hard to capture the end. It's hard to climb that summit. Um, I have a few of these actually and what is pretty common for me in this category is that these all seem to be nonfiction releases but there's one that stands out above the rest because a couple of them i've only tried once and not gotten to the end that's not really um you know the the type of thing i'm thinking about here like there's a couple books rise and fall of the third reich and uh, the second world war and i've gotten pretty far in both of them but they're both really lengthy books Uh, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich is uh, some 57 hours long, and the Second World War book is like 39 hours long. So these are lengthy titles. But um, what stopped me on those, especially the Second World War book, is I could only take so much listening to uh, the narrator talk about the concentration camps and the horrors therein and it was just so difficult to get through it all without frankly without wanting to retch it was just so brutal to do 
The book that I'm talking about is my true white whale, the one that I've started and stopped for so long and failed every single time to get to the end. It is also nonfiction. It's also a war-related book. But this one is Six Days of War by Michael B. Oren. It's narrated by Robert Whitfield. Um, it's not as long. It's only 17 hours long. I've listened to longer books this year than that. In fact, um, the breaks of the game that I finished for Audio Bingo that I talked about on last week's show, about the same length as, as this one. But for some reason, despite being fascinated by that particular subject and enjoying the book, um, Robert Whitfield is a British narrator and I've always had a little bit of trouble with those but uh, I'm getting better at it. It's not so much the accent, it's, uh, I don't know what it is. It, maybe it's the terminology. Maybe I'm just so used to American voices that it really is the accent, despite me just telling you that it wasn't. Um, I could be in denial, but uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting better at that. In fact, the longest book I've listened to this year had a British narrator, so. Uh, there's hope for me yet, but uh, six days of war. I cannot explain why I cannot seem to finish this book whenever I start it. And I've made four or five attempts over over ten years to to do this. And you say, well, why don't you just listen to part of it, get as far as you can, and then come back to it in a month or so to finish? Well, I could do that. I don't like to do that because. I keep a spreadsheet, and I will talk about my spreadsheet a lot going forward. Uh, I will even pull statistics from it for future shows. It would mess up the way that I do the spreadsheet if I listened to a book and then took a couple months off and then finished it because I try to calculate minutes listened to on a monthly basis and it's just easier to do if I listen to a book from start to finish and try to have all my books finished by the end of the given month. I don't even like to listen to a book if I think I'll finish on the first day of July. If I think I'll start on say June 29th and finish on the first day of July, I'll wait and I'll listen to it starting July 1st instead because I don't know what month to put what number of minutes in. So it's just easier for me to do that. But most of my problems listening to this book cannot be blamed on spreadsheets because most of my attempts to get through it were made before I even kept a spreadsheet. And in fact, I don't think I've given an attempt in about four years. So I'm due to try it again and try to uh, climb to the summit of Six Days of War by Michael B. Orn, narrated by Robert Whitfield. And I don't know if I'm ever going to be able to do it. But I want to know, this is the fan feedback question, I want to know if you have a book like this. I want to know because we have these books where we'll start and we'll stop because the story isn't interesting or the characters aren't engaging us or it's not fitting our current mood maybe we'll revisit it maybe we'll uh, return it if we can and exchange it for something else you know whatever the case may be there are books like that but i want to know if you have a book that you're genuinely interested in but you cannot seem to get past a certain point with it or you've found it a struggle maybe you have accomplished it maybe it's taken you a couple different attempts um, whatever the case may be it doesn't have to be a current one maybe you finally finally beat it maybe it's like beating a video game you play and you play and you play until you finally get over the hump but I'm curious if I'm the only one that has a book like this, a uh, audio Everest, so to speak, or if I'm one of many, because this book has vexed me for years. And it's, like I said, it's not necessarily because I find it boring or anything like that. The narration is a little bit dry, because, like I said, British voice, dry 
it's not necessarily an academic book, although it is used in history classes, but, you know, the text could be a little bit more... The what happened and why it happened is all there, but, you know, how people were feeling and things like that, and maybe some of the political intrigue is missing, and maybe that is one of the problems that I have, is that it's just such a, a dry read with a dry narrator, but... I'm bound and determined to finish this book one day. And I am going to play for you now a sample of Six Days of War. And I want you to listen to it. And maybe it'll have no appeal to you whatsoever. But it'll give you an idea of what I'm going to be up against as I eventually try to finish this book. Maybe I'll make it my half-year New Year's resolution. July 2nd, I believe, is the official halfway point of the year. Maybe I will make this my goal for the other half of the year to finish this book. But um, I want to know if you have a book like this. So back with our next segment after you listen to an excerpt from Six Days of War. international, regional, and domestic dimensions, a book intended for scholars but also accessible to a wider readership. This is the book I have set out to write. The task would prove formidable, due not only to the vastness of the research involved, but also to the radically controversial nature of Arab-Israeli politics. Great wars in history invariably become great wars of history, and the Arab-Israeli wars are no exception. For decades now, historians have been battling over the interpretation of those wars, beginning with the War of Independence, or the Palestine War of 1948, and progressing to the 1956 Suez Crisis. Most recently, a wave of revisionist writers, Israelis mostly, have sought to amplify Israel's guilt for those clashes and evince it in the debate over the borders or even the legitimacy of the Jewish state. That debate is now sharpening as historians begin to focus on 1967 and the conquest of Arab territories by Israel, some of which, the Golan, the West Bank, it still holds, and whose final disposition will affect the lives of millions. I, too, have been part of the debate and have my opinions. Yet in writing history, I view these preconceptions as obstacles to be overcome, rather than as convictions to confirm and indulge. Even if the truth can never fully be ascertained, I believe every effort must nevertheless be exerted in seeking it. And though the distance of over three decades affords invaluable historical perspectives, such viewpoints should never cloud our understanding of how the world appeared to the people of those tumultuous times. Employ hindsight, but humbly, remembering that life and death decisions are made by leaders in real time, and not by historians in retrospect. My purpose is not to prove the justness of one party or another in the war, or to assign culpability for starting it. I want simply to understand how an event as immensely influential as this war came about, to show the context from which it sprang, and the catalysts that precipitated it. I aspire to explore, using the 1967 example, the nature of international crises in general and the manner in which human interaction can produce totally unforeseen, unintended results. Mostly, I want to recreate the Middle East of the 1960s, to animate the extraordinary personalities that fashioned it, and to relive a period of history that profoundly impacts our own. Whether it is called the Sixth Day or the June War, my goal is that it never be seen the same way again. Jerusalem, 2002 Six Days of War The Context Arabs, Israelis and the Great Powers, 1948-1966 to Night Time December 31st, 1964. A squad of Palestinian guerrillas crosses from Lebanon into northern Israel. Armed with Soviet-made explosives, their uniforms supplied by the Syrians, 
they advance toward their target, a pump for conveying Galilee water to the Negev desert. A modest objective, seemingly, yet the Palestinians' purpose is immense. Members of the militant Al-Fatah, meaning the conquest, also a reverse acronym for the movement of the liberation of Palestine, they want to bring about the decisive showdown in the Middle East. Their action, they hope, will provoke an Israeli retaliation against one of its neighbouring countries, Lebanon itself or Jordan, igniting an all-Arab offensive to destroy the Zionist state. This Al-Fatah's maiden operation ends in fiasco. First, the explosive charges fail to detonate. Then, exiting Israel, the guerrillas are arrested by Lebanese police. Nevertheless, the leader of Al-Fatah, a 35-year-old former engineer from Gaza named Yasser Arafat, issues a victorious communique extolling the duty of jihad, holy war, and the dreams of revolutionary Arabs from the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf. A singularly limber imagination would have been required that New Year's Eve night to conceive that this act of small-scale sabotage, even had it been successful, could have triggered a war involving masses of men and materiel, a war that would change the course of Middle Eastern history and, with it, much of the world's. Yet, al fatahs operation contained many of the flashpoints that would set off precisely such a war in less than three years. There was, of course, the Palestinian dimension, a complex and volatile issue that plagued the Arab states as much as it did Israel. There was terror and Syrian support for it, and Soviet support for Syria, and there was water. More than any other individual factor, the war would revolve around water. Yet, to claim that that first al-Fatah operation, or any one of its subsequent attacks, brought about a general Middle East war would be far too simplistic and determinist. A beginning is an artifice, wrote Ian McEwan in his novel Enduring Love, and what recommends one over another is how much sense it makes of what follows. The observation certainly applies to history, where attempts to identify prime causes are often at best arbitrary, at worst futile. One could just as easily begin with early Zionist settlement in Palestine, or with British policy there after World War I, or with the rise of Arab nationalism, or with the Holocaust. The options are myriad and equally potentially valid. While it may be useless to try to pinpoint the cause or causes of the Middle East War of 1967, one can describe the context in which that war became possible much like the hypothetical butterfly that, flapping its wings, gives rise to currents that eventually generate a storm, so, too, might small, seemingly insignificant events spark processes leading ultimately to cataclysm. And just as that butterfly needs a certain context, the Earth's atmosphere, gravity, the laws of thermodynamics, to produce its tempest, so, too, did events prior to June 1967 require specific circumstances in order to precipitate war. The context was that of the Middle East in its post-colonial revolutionary period, a region torn by bitter internecine feuds, by superpower encroachment, and by the constant irritant of what had come to be known as the Arab-Israeli conflict. A Context Contrived even a discussion of a context must have a starting point, another arbitrary choice. Let us begin with Zionism, the Jewish people's movement to build an independent polity in their historical homeland. The introduction of Zionism into the maelstrom of Middle East politics galvanized what was already a highly unstable environment into a framework for regional war. Facile though it may sound, without Zionism there would have been no state of Israel, and without Israel no context of comprehensive conflict. What began as a mere idea in the mid-nineteenth century had, by the beginning of the twentieth, motivated thousands of European and Middle Eastern Jews to leave their homes and settle in unthinkably distant Palestine. The secret of Zionism lay in its wedding of modern nationalist notions to the Jewish people's mystical, millennial attachment to the land of Israel, Eretz Israel. 
that power sustained the Yishuv, or Jewish community, in Palestine throughout the depredations of Ottoman rule and during World War I, when many Jewish leaders were expelled as enemy, mostly Russian, aliens. By war's end, the British had supplanted the Turks in Palestine, and under the Balfour Declaration pledged to build a Jewish national home in the country. Under the British mandate, the Yishuv swelled with refugees from European anti-Semitism, first Polish, then German, and established social, economic, educational institutions that in a short time surpassed those furnished by Britain. By the 1940s, the Yishuv was a powerhouse in the making, dynamic, inventive, ideologically and politically pluralistic. Drawing on Western and Eastern European models, the Jews of Palestine created new vehicles for agrarian settlement, the communal kibbutz and cooperative moshav, a viable socialist economy with systems for national health, reforestation and infrastructure development, a respectable university and a symphony orchestra, and, to defend them all, an underground citizen's army, the Haganah. Though the British had steadily abandoned their support for a Jewish national home, that home was already a fact, an inchoate, burgeoning state. This was precisely what the Arabs of Palestine resented. Centuries established, representing the majority of the country's total population, the For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now, back to your host, Casey Trobry. And there you have it, an excerpt from the book that I hope to eventually finish at some point in my lifetime. Six Days of War by Michael B. Warren, narrated by Robert Whitfield. And now we're going to move on to what caught my ear for this week. And as usual, this is where I go in and I look at the titles that for me are coming soon but i try to pick one that comes out the same week that you hear this show uh something that i will definitely make it a point to listen to at some point in the near or far-flung future but um something that catches my ear get gets my attention not an endorsement necessarily because obviously i haven't listened to them yet but something that uh, basically, if I recommend it in this segment or feature it in this segment is perhaps a better word, since I just said it wasn't an endorsement. Uh, if I feature it in this segment, then you can bet that it, at the very least, has made it onto my wish list. Here this week, we have a historic Caught My Ear segment, the long and storied caught my ear segment of the talking audiobooks podcast is being shaken up because for the first time in the lengthy history of the podcast a history that dates all the way back to when thomas edison brought ken in and said sit down in front of this contraption and start talking about books that won't be recorded for you know another hundred years or so and just just make a podcast even though i don't know what that's going to be either but we're talking the long history of of this podcast that dates back to uh, the invention of the recorded word that we actually have two books this week on the Caught My Ear segment, one of which is something that I found a few weeks ago and I knew that it would be the book that I picked. But this other book and the one that I'm going to do first, I discovered more recently and saw that it came out the same week. So I thought, well, let's do two of them, since the one that I originally picked still caught my ear, but so does this other one. So let's do two, and you'll get to hear two excerpts. These are both nonfiction titles. Uh, it's a heavy nonfiction week this week on talking audiobooks, but what are you going to do? The first one is called 
the one device, the secret history of the iPhone, and it's by Brian Merchant. It's narrated by Tristan Morris. It is from Hachette Audio, and it is a science and technology book, and it's about the secret history of the iPhone. And this one caught my ear recently because I am an iPhone user. I actually got my first iPhone in May of 2012, the iPhone 4S, and I still have it, and I'm gonna keep it until uh, the newest version comes out later this fall, and I will upgrade uh, to that. But I've had my trusty iPhone for uh, just over five years. It's showing its age, and it does need to be replaced, but I'm cheap, and I also want to replace it with the newest phone that I can. So I will wait until the newest version comes out and listen to people complain about all the bugs and probably wait a, a month after that, and then I will go in and get my new iPhone. But um, this book caught my attention because as someone who has a disability and a visual disability, the iPhone sort of was a profound difference maker in my life and how I conduct business. And I really find it difficult to imagine what my life would be like if I had never gotten an iPhone. It's entirely possible, actually, that there wouldn't be a podcast if I had never gotten an iPhone, despite the fact that I don't use my iPhone to record this podcast. But getting the iPhone sort of required me to have iTunes installed, and that made me listen to more audiobooks. And there are links in the chain. You know, like I said, I don't want to necessarily be uh, one of those people where you, you say, oh, well, he loves Apple and he's an Apple apologist. I actually have another book on the history of the Blackberry as well that has been on my to listen list for quite a while. You know, it, it struck me in a personal way. The book that I'll get to in a bit uh, is more impersonal. It's just something that I'm interested in. But this one, I have a more personal interest because this is a product that I literally use every day. So the secret history of the iPhone, that's the subtitle really. The, the actual title is The One Device. This is about 14 and a half hours long. I've never heard uh, Tristan Morris as a narrator before, so that will be a new experience. So I'm looking forward to this one on a personal level. I don't know when I'm going to get to listening to it because I have a bit of a backlog and I have other things that I need to get to for the purposes of this show and potential future interviews. But right now, here is an excerpt from The One Device written by Brian Merchant, narrated by Tristan Morris from Hachette Audio. Apple's user testing lab at 2 Infinite Loop had been abandoned for years. Down the hall from the famed industrial design studio, the space was divided by a one-way mirror so hidden observers could see how ordinary people navigate new technologies. But Apple didn't do user testing. Not since Steve Jobs returned as CEO in 1997. Under Jobs, Apple would show consumers what they wanted, not solicit their feedback. But that deserted lab would make an ideal hideaway for a small group of Apple's more restless minds, who had quietly embarked on an experimental new project. For months, the team had held unofficial meetings, marked by freewheeling brainstorms. Their mission was vague, but simple. Explore new, rich interactions. The ENRI group, let's call it, was tiny. It included a few of Apple's young software designers, a key industrial designer, and a handful of adventurous input engineers. They were, essentially, trying to invent new ways of interacting with machines. Since its inception, the personal computer had relied on a century-old framework that allowed humans to tell it what to do a keyboard laid out like a typewriter, the same basic tool a 19th-century newspaper man used to write copy. The only major addition to the input arsenal had been the mouse. Throughout the information revolution of the second half of the 20th century, that was how most people navigated its bounty, with a typewriter and a clicker. 
near-infinite digital possibilities. Dusty old user interface. By the beginning of the 21st century, the Internet was mainstream and maturing. Online media was complex and interactive. Apple's own iPod was moving digital music into people's pockets, and the personal computer had become a hub for maps, movies, and images. The ENRI group predicted that typing and clicking would soon prove frustratingly cumbersome, and we'd need new ways to interact with all that rich media, especially on Apple's storied computer. There was a core little secret group, says one member, Joshua Stricken, with the goal of re-envisioning input on the Mac. The team was experimenting with every stripe of bleeding-edge hardware, motion sensors, new kinds of mice, a burgeoning technology known as multi-touch, in a quest to uncover a more direct way to manipulate information. The meetings were so discreet that not even Jobs knew where they were taking place. The gestures, user controls, and design tendencies stitched together here would become the cybernetic vernacular for the new century, because the kernel of this clandestine collaboration would become the iPhone. Yet its pioneers' achievements have largely been hidden from view, stranded on the other side of that one-way mirror by an intensely secretive corporation and its late, spotlight-commanding CEO. The story of the iPhone starts, in other words, not with Steve Jobs or a grand plan to revolutionize phones, but with a misfit crew of software designers and hardware hackers tinkering with the next evolutionary step in human-computer symbiosis. Assembling the Team User interface design is still unknown to most people, even now, a member of the original iPhone team tells me. For one thing, the term user interface feels pulled right from a technical manual. The label itself seems uniquely designed to dull the senses. There's no rock star UI designer, he says. There's no Johnny Ive of UI. But if there were, they'd be Bas Ording and Imran Chowdhury. They're the Lennon McCartney of UI. Ording and Chowdhury met during some of Apple's darkest days. Ording, a Dutch software designer with a flair for catchy, playful animations, was hired into the Human Interface Group in 1997, the year the company hemorrhaged a billion dollars in lost revenue and Jobs returned to staunch the bleeding. Chowdhury, a sharp British designer, as influenced by MTV's icons as Apple's, had arrived a few years before and survived Jobs' slash-and-burn layoffs. I first met Imran at some point in the parking lot smoking cigarettes, Ording says. We were like, hey dude, they make for an odd pair. Boss is lanky, easygoing, and... For you, the listeners of the Talking Audiobooks podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash talking audiobooks for your free audiobook. And now back to your host, Casey Trowbridge. If you don't want to use your free Audible credit on the one device, maybe this book will interest you more. It's called The Fall of the House of FIFA, the Multi-Million Dollar Corruption at the Heart of Global Soccer. This is by David Kahn, C-O-N-N. It is narrated by Matthew Watterson, another narrator that I am not very familiar with. It has a running time of 12 hours and 40 minutes, and it is also from Hachette Audio. So. They capture both of the slots in the What Caught My Ear segment this week, so big props to them. This is obviously a sports title. FIFA is the international governing body behind soccer. Of course, the World Cup is the biggest FIFA event, and a few years ago there was a big scandal. Some uh, bribery was alleged. Some people were arrested. Some people were voted out of their FIFA offices. It was a big mess, and this book is going to chronicle all of that. And this book is one that doesn't affect me as personally as the last one did. I'm not really a soccer fan, to be honest. I would rather 
do anything else probably than watch soccer. And what made me like soccer even less was I can remember tuning in to ESPN back in 2010, seeing a little bit of the World Cup. I thought they were playing it in a beehive because I kept hearing this stupid buzzing sound It was constant, it was annoying, it was frustrating, and I found out that this was from a horn called a Vuvuzela. This thing is the most annoying thing I've ever come across in my life. I told my friends that if they ever thought it would be funny to get me one of these for like Christmas or my birthday or anything just as a gag gift that I would never speak to them again because this thing is just that annoying. I thought, like I said, they were playing soccer in a beehive i refuse to listen to any sporting event where these things are present some sporting competitions have banned them entirely because they're annoying as all get out but that's really a digression from the point but what this book is for me and why it interests me is this is a phenomenon that i experience every once in a while where I will hear about a news item such as the FIFA scandal and I'll think, man, that's really interesting. Someday someone's gonna write a good book about this. And last year, the only positive thing I had to say about the 2016 presidential election was the fact that someday someone would have a good book to write about all this nonsense. And I don't want anybody to think, oh, he's upset over the winner or anything like that. I made this comment long before anybody was voting on anything. Um, I said the only saving grace is that there'll be a good book to come out of it. So that's something that happens to me every once in a while where I will see something and I think, man, that has potential to be an interesting book. And last year's election was one example. The fall of the House of FIFA, this soccer scandal that broke out a few years ago, not really all that surprising an event, to be perfectly honest. Um, I don't regard these international organizations with a lot of high esteem. That's just me personally. I'm sure there's a big IOC corruption scandal that could break at any moment. It's only natural to say things like that when there's lots of money involved and big stakes and political favors and things like that, that some chicanery takes place. What fascinates me about this book, the fact that when, when all this stuff came out a few years ago, I thought, man, someone would write a great book on this one day. I hope this ends up being it. We'll see. It's on my listen list to find out. It's still fairly recent, but there's been a little bit of time that has passed. And so there's a little bit more of a, a certainty and a little bit more of an idea of what has gone down and what the consequences of that have been. Although it's still sort of... Uh, affecting things because it's affecting the 2018 and 2022 World Cup. So there are things in play here. I think this is the right time for a book like this. The presidential election will have to wait. And I'm sure by the time you hear this, maybe I'll see another news story and I'll think that'll make for a great book in a couple of years. Who knows? So here is an excerpt from the fall of the House of FIFA, the million dollar corruption at the Heart of Global Soccer by David Kahn, narrated by Matthew Watterson. Again, from Heshat Audio, they have had a good week this week. And we'll be back right after this excerpt from the fall of the House of FIFA. It was exactly 35 years later when I had grown up a bit and become a journalist drawn into investigating modern football's entanglements with money that I first encountered the American FIFA chief, Charles Chuck Blazer. It was in the Gulf, in Abu Dhabi, in the summer of 2009. I was there because I was inquiring for The Guardian into the improbable takeover of my boyhood football club, 
the beloved sky blue of Manchester City by the scion of that far-flung country's ruling family, Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed al Nayan. Mansour's executives had suggested that to understand Abu Dhabi and its intentions for city, I should come and see the country when preparations were stepping up for the FIFA Club World Championship, which they were hosting as part of their broader nation-promoting activities. There was to be an update and a press conference, some excitements at the country's one big football stadium, and the local Al Jazeera football club, which Mansour also owned. That was why Blazer was there. He was the FIFA Executive Committee member with responsibility for overseeing the club world championship. A New Yorker, he had, in 1996, garnered this position of power among the 24 men of the world governing body's highest decision-making forum, whose responsibility extended to voting on which country should host the World Cup. His ascendance came six years after Blazer had been appointed the Secretary General, like a chief executive, of his geographical football region, CONCACAF, the Confederation of North and Central America and Caribbean Football Associations. In that position, he had worked intimately for 20 years with Jack Warner, a former college history lecturer in his native Trinidad, whom Blazer had supported to become the CONCACAF president in 1990. Warner had since, as the two of them planned, led a coalescing of power for the small Caribbean islands, uniting to cast their votes as a block of 31 among CONCACAF's 41 countries, which included much bigger nations, principally the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. In the election of a president, all FIFA's 211 countries' FAs vote, so Warner could become a man of influence, wielding the bloc CONCACAF and Caribbean numbers. CONCACAF were entitled to elect or appoint three members to the FIFA Executive Committee, the same number as the South America Football Confederation, CONMEBOL, Oceania, representing New Zealand and mostly Pacific Island countries, had one representative. The Confederation of African Football and Asian Football Confederation had four each. UEFA, representing Europe, the richest, strongest and oldest football region, had, through the politics and compromises which shaped FIFA over the years, retained eight representatives. The president, Sepp Blatter, elected by a majority of the member FAs in 1998, 2002 and unopposed in 2006, made it 24, sitting around the top table at FIFA headquarters, the so-called House of FIFA in Zurich. Jack Warner would become a great deal more notorious after 2009, but he was already infamous then for his fiery, declamatory manner and for his involvement in ticketing scandals over the years. The first, in 1989, concerned the crucial World Cup final qualifying match for Trinidad and Tobago, which his home country had only to draw with the USA to claim a place in the 1990 World Cup. Terrible overcrowding outside and inside the stadium led to the accusation that Warner, the president of the Trinidad and Tobago FA, had had 15,000 too many tickets printed and sold, leading to a judicial inquiry which never reported. Watched from the packed stands, the USA won the match 1-0, and they, rather than a devastated home side, went through to play at the World Cup in Italy. In 2006, Warner was found by FIFA's own inquiry, conducted by the consultants Ernst & Young, to have had tickets for that year's World Cup in Germany picked up by his son, Darion. They were then provided to a travel company, Sim Paul, owned by the Warner family, which sold them at a premium, above face value, in breach of FIFA's rules. FIFA's disciplinary committee reprimanded Jack Warner, but took no action against him because, they concluded, it could not be proved that he knew about the resale of the tickets. Hey, audio fans, this is producer Ken, inviting you to join Jess and Tina's super fun audiobook challenge. Jess from the audiobookworm.com and Tina from astoldbytina.net have put their heads together and come up with a unique way to celebrate the fact that June is audiobook month. 
The object is to get three in a row or fill out all nine squares on your audio bingo card. A printable version of the card can be found at theaudiobookworm.com. The nine spaces to fill in are as follows. One, listen to an audiobook narrated by the author. Two, listen to an audiobook recommended by a friend. Three, listen to an audiobook that has been on your TBR or to be read list. I guess this should be TBL for to be listened list. Anyway, listen to an audiobook that's been on your list for more than a year. Number four, listen to an audiobook that was released within the last month. Number five, free space. Number six, listen to an audiobook that was released during your birth month. Number seven, listen to an audiobook with a narrator that has the same first initial as you. Number eight, listen to an audiobook narrated by a famous actor. Number nine, re-listen to your favorite audiobook. The officially recognized hashtag for this event is hashtag audio bingo. This is a challenge after all, so why not spark a competition among your friends and family? It's a great way to get them to listen to audiobooks, maybe even for the first time. It's also a good opportunity to get to know your fellow listeners via social media. The Talking Audiobooks podcast's very own Casey Trowbridge is participating, and he'll be discussing his progress in future episodes. The challenge is going to be active for the entire month of June, so start listening and have fun. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will be the last time this year you hear the audio bingo promo because, while well, the contest runs through the end of June. It would be pointless to tell you how to play the game on June 30th since, while I suppose it's possible you could listen to nine audiobooks in a day, it's not likely that you're going to make the attempt. And with that having been said, let me give you my audio bingo progress. And my audio bingo progress is that I am finished. In fact, as I record this, I am just minutes away from having finished. I finished The Martian, which was my ninth space, the re-listen to a favorite audiobook space. And that means that I am done. Uh, The last time I was with you, I was working on the breaks of the game. And in fact, I mentioned that if I wasn't finished, by the time you heard that episode that something would have gone wrong. Well, something didn't go wrong, but by the time the podcast episode was made available last week, I was still working on it and didn't finish until later that day. It took me six days to get through that book, six days to get through the sixth book on my uh, list, and that was the longest title that it took me to complete. After that, um, I will not repeat all of the titles that I have listed or I've read for um, Bingo. Uh, You can find those on my Goodreads page, though, at Audiobook Casey on Goodreads, goodreads.com slash Audiobook Casey, rather. And like I said, I won't repeat all of them, but I'll just tell you about the last few. I finished the breaks of the game on the 16th of June. On June 17th, I listened to a book narrated by the author. I picked Almost Interesting by David Spade. I thought that was a good book, but it ended a little bit earlier than I expected. I would have liked for him to talk about his sitcom starring days on Just Shoot Me and Rules of Engagement, but he didn't really get into that very much at all. But it was an enjoyable enough listen. And then I listened to Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton, narrated by Scott Brick. That was a book recommended to me by a friend. That was a space on the bingo card. Um, A friend of mine actually gave me that book last year, and I hadn't read it, and I thought, well, you need a book recommended by a friend, so why not pick one that a friend actually gave me? So I listened to Jurassic Park, and I really enjoyed that, and I'm going to listen to the sequel, The Lost World, at some point hopefully in the near future. And then, as I said, to close off my audio bingo listening, I listened to The Martian by Andy Weir, narrated by R.C. Bray. That was a favorite audiobook from a couple years ago. Probably talk about The Martian more in depth on a future show. I have a sort of theme idea for when vacation time comes and different things, so you can still get a podcast and I can be enjoying myself doing something else but uh, we'll talk about that in the future no vacation plans anytime soon 
I'm not like Ken, I don't do four of these and then take five months off to recover, but. You're fired. I have no choice, you're fired. Um, interestingly, when you listen to the show, I will have officially hosted as many episodes of Talking Audiobooks as Ken did, so. You're fired. I have no choice, you're fired. Uh, how about that? Another milestone besides completing Audio Bingo. Um, audio Bingo, you know, came from Jess and Tina, and I have to say that it was a fun experience because having so many uh, squares to fill out meant that I didn't really have any guesswork as to what I was going to listen to. I had parameters, is what I'm trying to say. I could make choices within those parameters, but um, I had parameters nonetheless. And that actually made it easy for me to find things to read this month, whereas I might not have uh, had as much success just listening to books if I hadn't had this task. Um, having, for example, a book narrated by someone with the same first initial as you, that's a criteria, so I would go through my list and I would find one and, and I would listen to it. That would meet a certain qualification. Listening to a, a book from your birth month is a certain qualification. So it would actually help pair my rather large audiobook library, some 11 175 titles as I record this, down to manageable numbers to pick from from each category. And so that actually, in a way, made it easy for me to pick the books that I listened to this month. And so I thought it was a worthwhile experiment. I hope they do it again next year. And if they don't do it again next year, I may come up with my own version and steal their idea. Give them proper credit, if I can remember to but still their idea nonetheless, and I will uh, try to come up with my own different spaces and maybe even do a longer one that would be like a year and that you would have a year to complete, but there would be a lot more boxes to check off because I do have some ideas for possible uh, squares on a bingo card if I decide to do it or if they were to ask me for suggestions for next year. I have a few ideas, but their um, ideas were pretty good and it was an enjoyable experience. I'm glad I did it. So thanks to Jess and Tina for that. So I'm finished with audio bingo. Uh, I plan to take a couple days off because... You're fired. I have no choice. You're fired. The last couple days, I hadn't really gotten much sleep. <laughs> And I'm just going to take a break and not really listen to any books. I'm going to get caught up on podcasts, maybe watch a little TV. I have a podcast-related project that I need to get done. Can't really talk about that right now, but uh, you'll know about it when and if it comes to pass. So I have a few things to do in the future, but it's nice to have audio bingo done and finished and speaking of finished, this week's episode of Talking Audiobooks is finished. It's been an, another enjoyable episode, uh, kind of a different episode than any of the previous ones. We've had a couple different things uh, format-wise over the four weeks that I've done this. So really, none of them have been the same, and that's good. But uh, I want to reiterate that interviews are coming. We're working on it. Uh, July is probably going to be interview heavy, and after that we should have interviews on a fairly regular basis. You won't just be hearing me talk, and hopefully you won't be hearing Ken, other than reading the commercials that you'll be skipping over anyway. You're fired. I have no choice. You're fired. But uh, this week's episode has been fun, as always, for me to record. I hope you've had a lot of fun times listening to it remind you again that our audio uh, book giveaway is still going on. We have um, six audible credits that we're going to give away to one lucky winner based on the entries that we've gotten so far. So if you want six audible credits that you can use on six books of your choice, whatever they might be, 
You can pick them off your wish list. You can pre-order titles that you have an interest in. Whatever you want to do, no strings attached. Uh, just email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com before June 30th. You'll be entered in the giveaway. And um, what I would like you to do is if you have already emailed us and you haven't heard from me, if I haven't replied to you, I want you to do me a favor and email Audiobook Empire. That's all one word, Audiobook Empire at midco, M I D C O dot net, and say, hey, I sent an email to the feedback account and I never heard back from you. The reason is we've had some issues with the email inbox. And so if you haven't heard back from us, I want to make sure that you are entered in the giveaway. So email me at audiobookempire at midco.net and um, let me know. Say, hey, I haven't heard from you. I emailed the feedback address. If you have the email you sent, resend it in that uh, message to me and I will make sure that you are entered. This is six audible promo codes, people. You can use them on anything you want. So with that having all been said, it's time for me to say goodbye. And so I will say goodbye and tell you to keep listening. Talking Audiobooks is a trademark of KenJoy Media, produced by KenJoy Media, copyright 2017, all rights reserved. Your host has been Casey Trowbridge, produced by Ken Joy. Theme music composed by Christian Anderson, licensed through EpidemicMusic.com. Visit our website at TalkingAudiobooks.com. Follow us on Twitter at Talking Audio. Follow us on Facebook at Talking Audiobooks. And subscribe to the Talking Audiobooks YouTube channel. Here's a disclaimer. Various sponsors like Audible.com help make this podcast possible. However, they are not responsible for its content. They don't dictate what we talk about or what books we share with you. And therefore, the opinions that you hear on here are unfortunately those of the host and our guests. We'd love to hear from you, so email us at feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. Tell us what audiobooks you're listening to, what you've liked in the past, narrators that you like. Ask us questions, anything. It's for your feedback. Feedback at talkingaudiobooks.com. That's it. See you next time on Talking Audiobooks.